<laughs> so um, many of you probably already seen these acronyms before. Um, ABA, which is Applied Behavior Analysis, PBIS, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports, MTSS, Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, uh, Tiers of Intervention, Conscious Discipline, our CPI Nonviolent Crisis Intervention Programs, Person-Centered Values. All of these are basically interrelated. They focus on the individual and promoting that quality of life. Um, we want to expand a student's uh, behavior repertoire with systematic methods that are tried and true and, and based on evidence-based practices, okay? So today, more so, we're going to focus on those non-aversive type of strategies because 40 years of research in ABA has demonstrated that non-aversive procedures actually help promote learning and engaging in those socially meaningful behaviors while decreasing the occurrence of those what we call problematic or challenging behaviors. But we first have to, and I'm going into Spanish back and forth, we first have to successfully figure out the function of the behavior. And that's why I want to talk about that more in depth today. PBIS, along with probably the others that I've listed, all basically came together because of ABA. Thumbs up if you can see the next slide. Can you? Yes, we can see it. Good, good. The third slide. Perfect. You've muted yourself again. Better? Yes. I think every time Debbie mutes everybody, I get muted and I, and I don't realize it. I'm sorry, you guys. Just let me know. Be candid. Um, so sometimes what we see as a failure to behave properly is actually a failure to communicate properly. What we do, all of our behavior, it serves a purpose. Um, but sometimes we just don't understand why people do what they do, right? So we kind of have to put our detective caps on and we have to spend some time analyzing the behavior. You all as parents right now have a lot of time, hopefully, to, to assess your child's behavior and try and figure out, okay, why are they doing that, right? And, and that's what I wanna focus on today is how to assess the behavior, how to analyze it, how to break it down to really understand it and to understand why people, kids, children do what they're doing, okay? So we're gonna talk about antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. Sometimes we just expect our kids to behave in certain ways, right? respectful, polite, obedient, careful, fun, considerate, the list can go on. And sometimes our kids, our adolescents, our teens, and even us as adults, we don't always behave the way we should or the way people want us to behave. Sometimes behavior is, is a choice, but sometimes it's a necessity in order to meet our needs, especially when we don't know another way of meeting those needs or when our current behavior doesn't meet, does meet our needs, right? So for purposes of this training, we're going to focus on those behaviors that are challenging, okay? And those behaviors that we may not understand, those behaviors that we may want to go away. Um, in order to decrease these challenging, maladaptive problem behaviors, we need to put our detective hats on, like I said earlier, and really understand it. We need to think in terms of this ABC formula. A being what happened before a behavior occurred, immediately before, maybe even referred to as a trigger behavior, what the student or your child is doing, and then the consequence, what happened immediately after the behavior that your child or student did, okay? Let's dive a bit into the A, the antecedent. These are those triggers that lead up to a behavior. There's so many possible antecedents that can exist, but here are just some common examples, okay? Being told no. How many of your children have difficulty accepting that word? Just that word itself can trigger a problematic behavior. Any instruction or direction or multiple step instructions or directions, interaction with certain people, certain individuals, or just people in general might bug a child um, changes in activities, changes in routines, um, tasks 
that may be just too long, too hard, too boring for them, whether they want attention or they don't want your attention. Any comments that may be said, especially if they're comments about them or questioning them for whatever reason, they don't want to be bothered. We see this a lot with our teenagers, right? They don't question me, mom, stop asking me. They're private at this point. Um, and then transitions between one thing to another thing, especially if it's going from a preferred to a less preferred type of activity, right? These are typical triggers to problem behavior. And then we have our behavior, of course. And behavior is anything, any response to an event, a cause or a condition, right? It, it's, it fulfills a specific need. I'm just listing some examples that are common of those behaviors we don't wanna see, those behaviors we wanna get rid of. For example, the hitting, the kicking, the biting, the hair pulling, throwing up items, throwing furniture, um, head banging, biting themselves, right? Pulling out their hair, screaming, running away from where they're supposed to be, crying, throwing stuff to the floor, climbing on stuff, eating stuff that isn't edible. These are the behaviors that I'm, I'm talking about whenever I'm saying challenging, problematic, maladaptive type of behaviors. And then we have our C, our consequence. What's happening as a result of that behavior? Or how does one react to that behavior, immediately react to that behavior, right? But the consequence is what can either increase a behavior, make it happen again and again, again or decrease the behavior, make it happen less and less. Some consequences that you commonly see either from parents or teachers are just being sent to time out, being sent to their room, or in the schools, being sent to the principals, being sent to the counselor's office, being scolded for their actions, or being reprimanded, being redirected to do something else, receiving that support from a caregiver, that support from a teacher, that support from a sibling, giving attention, that's a consequence. Comments or laughs from others, even scolding, those are consequences. Those can happen immediately after behavior or taking tasks away or giving a child a preferred item or activity. Those are all what I'm talking about, consequences. Okay, but while we're playing detective, we also need to consider what is called a setting event because sometimes even though the antecedent and consequence are happening the same, we might notice some changes in behavior. For example, for the longest you've been working uh, with your child that he takes his medication. For, there was an aversion to meds, didn't want to take the meds. But now for two straight weeks, every single day, your child has followed his routine waking up at 7 a.m., using the restroom, walking to the kitchen, eating his breakfast, taking his meds, and then having access to preferred items within his room for several hours, okay? Because he needed those meds. But let's say today he yelled and threw a fit and threw the medication on the floor. Everything happened in order to a typical day, but today of all days, he doesn't respond or act the same, okay? So then you're asking yourself, well, what happened? What were any changes? Well, this is when setting events come into place, right? Let's ask ourselves some questions about setting events. So setting events are anything that can increase the likelihood of a behavior occurring. Setting events are different than antecedent events, okay? The term setting events, at that point, moment in time because of one of these environmental, social, or physiological factors, behavior may change because the value of obtaining something and the value of avoiding something is different because of maybe one of these. So things to consider that might alter the value of something are crowded conditions within an environment, having a lot of people within your home, different times of the day, certain musics, um, the, just the layout of their environment, transitions, like I said, to and from, change, major life changes. So think of what's going on right now with COVID-19. This is a major life change. This is most likely a setting event as well. Um, negative social interactions, uh, family conflicts, family dynamic issues, certain people, 
losing a game, not enough exercise, illness, pain, allergy, side effects from medications, changes in medication. Um, the list can go on and on. These are just some of those common examples, okay? So when I was reviewing the previous slide, I talked about a hypothetical situation of a kiddo who was engaging in these challenging behaviors while refusing to take his medication, which he's taken without a problem for the past two weeks. So it turns out that this kiddo ate maybe the mom's food, your food, and it just didn't sit well. He was feeling so nauseous almost immediately after eating his breakfast but he didn't have those words. He lacked that receptive communication skill to express to his mom that he thinks the men might make him feel worse. So instead he does what he knows best. He does what he did two weeks ago that served to get him what he wants. In this case, to get him uh, to escape from having to take those medication. And that's why understanding setting events and, and when you play a detective, thinking about these setting events also helps us figure out the function, the reason for a behavior. So as you may have just um, noticed by what I said about that hypothetical situation, behaviors are complex, <laughs> but there's always a reason for everything you do. There's a payoff, there's some gain. All of us have something we want, right? So um, when you're attempting to understand your child's behavior, we must consider or discover the reason and we must discover therefore the function. So by looking at these antecedents and consequences that occur over a course of time, so you see a pattern to, to determine, well, what's the likely function? Because remember, all behavior pays off in some way, okay? Okay, so these are the four typical functions of behavior. In essence, if you can remember the term or the acronym SEAT, you'll remember those four typical functions of behavior. Sensory escape, access to something tangible, um, attention, right? So remember that couch. Okay, so let's start off with the S. Let's start off with the sensory, which is um, sometimes we behave in certain ways because it just, it just feels good. No one needs to be around for us to do this. It's stimulating in some way, shape, or form. It stimulates our pleasure parts of our brain, right? Um, typically, behaviors that serve a sensory function, they can occur anytime in the presence or in the absence of others. And sometimes whenever our children engage in self-stimulatory behavior, we really want to ask ourselves, are they, is it a sensory uh, function? Because sometimes we don't even realize that a kid may actually like that pressure, may, may actually like the way the, the pain feels because they don't usually feel too much pain. So they feel something when they hit their bodies towards the wall or hit their hands towards the table. Um, an adaptive example of a, of a sensory function would be Cindy sits at the table touching, stretching, and pounding on that Play-Doh. Maybe it's while well, there's dinner time or maybe it's during learning time. But a maladaptive example is Cindy sits at the table pounding on it so loudly and frequently that she bruises her hands from all that pounding. Okay, so which one would we choose? Which one is more socially acceptable and probably less harmful, right? right? It'd be the adaptive example. So let's move on to E, which stands for escape. So escape is we do something because we want to get out of it. We want to avoid it for whatever reason. It makes us feel uncomfortable. We just don't like it. But that's a big one. This we see a lot. Escape maintaining behaviors may be due to motivation or it may be due to a skill deficit. So you want to ask yourselves, is it a performance deficit or is it skill deficit? I believe when um, Kim Cantua and Susana Aila Salgado did presentations in the past for the CAC, um, they spoke about the, uh, a way to assess whether it's a skill deficit or performance deficit. And that uh, is located on, our PENT, on the PENT website, which I have there linked, okay? Because it's really important um, because no matter what 
we offer or no matter how we reward a student if they don't have that skill they don't have that ability they're not going to do it right i can't do the splits you offer me 10 chocolate chip cookies which i love i cannot do this you give me 100 dollars. i can't do the splits so we need to think in those terms whenever we're working with our children especially nowadays when we're presenting them with these you know worksheets and homeworks that they're not getting that one-on-one -on -one instruction from their teachers or from staff and with the common core it's very difficult i should say for me um, so an adaptive example of escapement behavior might be bobby politely asks his parents if he can take a break from his studies a maladaptive example is bobby rips a fit worksheet and throws it on the floor okay these are both examples of escape maintain behavior Now we'll go on to the A, attention. We see this a lot as well. Um, behaving in a way to get attention from someone, right? We have sometimes kids who, who want our attention all the time, all throughout the day. I had a parent who spoke with me yesterday saying, my kiddo constantly wants attention from me. What do I do? Um, so attention, though, isn't always in the form of a pleasant uh, interaction. Sometimes kids are okay with non-pleasant interactions, reprimands, scolding, yelling. As long as they get that attention, that's what they want. Especially when kids aren't getting that more pleasant attention, but they crave it, they're gonna seek in any means possible. An adaptive example of attention-seeking uh, behavior would be Bobby asks his mom, will you play outside with me? And then she plays outside, right? He used his words, asked appropriately, and mom rewarded him by, Sure, let's go. Maladaptive example, Bobby whines to get his mom to play outside with him. Okay, we don't want the whining. We want appropriate asking if they have a uh, language. And then we have T, which is actually access to tangibles. Behaving in a certain way to access a preferred item, toy, uh, food, game, something, right? Um, access maintaining behavior may be gesturing towards something, pointing at something, uh, pulling on your hand, on your arm to get something, or um, using pictures to get something. It can also be problematic behaviors like whining and throwing, um, stealing, right? So an adaptive example of an access to tangible would be Cindy hands a picture item to her dad to ask for the game. That's beautiful, right? Especially if we're if we're teaching a child how to appropriately request stuff, or we're starting that um, that speech and language therapy. That's that's a beautiful example. A maladaptive example would be Cindy screams and cries when she sees her sister with the game. She wants it, and that's her only way. Her parents are probably going to say, like, "Okay, you can have it. We don't want you screaming and crying." Okay. So, for example, I just want us to think, because my, my, uh, my goal is that you guys know how to play a detective and now understand how to identify an antecedent, a behavior, and a consequence given a scenario or given your specific situation with your child, right? So in this example, a parent says, go brush your teeth while their child is playing video games. And the child says, but I had to finish the game. And the consequence is the parent says, okay, fine, fine, five more minutes. So in this case, looking at the behavior, looking at the antecedent, looking at the, what's the possible function of that behavior saying, but I have to finish the game. What do we think it might be? Well, a few seconds, just think about it. Access to video games, right? They want access to something tangible or do they want to avoid brushing their teeth? Or is it both? Like I said earlier, behavior is complex. So it's our job and your jobs as caregivers, right? To try and figure out which one is it? Or is it both? Because that's the only way we can actually implement effective interventions. We have to understand the function because different interventions serve for different functions, right? And we don't wanna reward the wrong behaviors. But the only way we can really understand it is if we collect data. And I hate throwing that out there because data just sounds so daunting to do, but it can be very simple. It doesn't have to be all day type of data collection. And I've included some examples. 
okay? So this is just your basic ABC chart. It's direct observation. You observe your child for a few minutes in a given situation, a given setting, and then you collect that data. You collect information about those events that are occurring within his or her environment. This will give you like a picture of possible functions of behavior, whether it's uh, sensory, escape, attention, or access to something, okay? This will paint a picture because you're gonna see those patterns in behavior. And if you take um, time of when you're actually doing these observations, it gives you even more information, okay? This is important. This is important, like I said earlier, in order to create those effective interventions and to increase those appropriate socially meaningful skills that we want to see and decrease those challenging, problematic, more maladaptive type of behaviors. Hmm. This is another one. This I added here, this is something typically we use in the schools because um, teachers are busy, okay? So it's way easier to just circle or put a check mark next to what they think was the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence, and maybe the activity, because that lets us know, well, in which type of setting may this kiddo not behave the best way, or in which type of setting may they behave the better way, right? So these are just some common examples, but you could totally change it up. You can use just a worksheet, you can use a blank sheet, a dry erase board. Um, when I worked as a school psychologist, I often used post-it notes. I had piles and piles of post-it notes and that's how I took some data or little tiny sheets. Um, but it's really helpful because like I said, that's the only way we can figure out the function of behavior for the most part. And unless we understand the function, then we won't understand how to intervene appropriately or effectively. We may just be wasting our time or we may just be producing more maladaptive behavior and we don't wanna do that. Okay, so just to sum it all up, all right, you have your antecedent, you have your behavior, you have your consequence, and then you, the function is directly related to that consequence, um, but then also keeping in mind those setting events, okay? So now let's talk more about some strategies and interventions that you might find useful and that are commonly used within the classrooms. Okay. I want us to think in terms of setting up your child for success, setting up yourself for success as well. Antecedents in, antecedent interventions, sorry, those, they address the, the physical, the social, the physiological events that trigger a behavior. Antecedent interventions are preventative uh, strategies to use, okay? We want to reduce those challenging behaviors before they occur. And why? You may ask, because some people ask or assume that, well, if they're not occurring, how are we giving them the opportunity to engage in behaviors and then teach them appropriate behaviors? It's not that we're totally eliminating the opportunity. The opportunities will be there, especially for a really challenging behavior, but we're trying to reduce the opportunities that a child fails or engages in, in maladaptive behavior. Because the more opportunities we have setting them up for success, the more we can reward them for that success, the more intrinsic motivation they get to engage in more socially meaningful and acceptable behaviors, okay? Um, so what can we do? Um, here I have it broken down kind of like the functions of behavior. If, it's, if your child's engaging in maladaptive behavior due to sensory needs, then let's offer some sensory bins or activities. Let's intersperse them throughout their day, all day. Okay, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, let's allow for maybe sensory input in other ways. Earlier, I gave an example of a child uh, pounding, I think it was Cindy, pounding on the table and she was bruising her hands. Well, the parent gave the child Play-Doh and Play-Doh was like, oh, this feels good. I can pound on it and it's not as loud and it's not bruising my hands, right? Think of other ways, alternative sensory items. Um, for a lot of kids we see they need uh, earplugs, headphones, that to decrease some noise. Um, when we have children engaging in escape maintained behavior, then we want to ensure, like I mentioned earlier, that the tasks are provided at their instructional level, that we give them something they know how to do for the most part, okay? That we provide plenty of structure, plenty of routine, and that we provide movement breaks. Who wants to be sitting for long periods of time? I'm sure a lot of you, after an hour, you guys tune out. 
I, I do sometimes. So we need to think of our kids just like that. They're going to tune out as well. They need their brain and movement breaks. If children are engaging in challenging behaviors due to this attention seeking, then we want to give them that attention as much as possible throughout the entire day. Um, maybe in bed opportunities where you guys hang out and work together. Um, just whatever attention, we want to be proactive about it because we don't want to give them attention when they're crying and screaming and hurting themselves, right? We don't want to do that, especially if that's what they're looking for. In essence, we're rewarding them for crying and screaming and hurting themselves. If it's attention maintained behavior, that's what we need to find out the function. If it's that they want something, they want access to something, then allowing them to work towards that access or giving them that access for short durations of time throughout the school day or throughout the uh, home day uh, might be what you need. Um, Kim Cantua, Susana, Avila Sagara spoke about the affirm modules at the last two presentations they did for CAC. And I think they also uploaded the website. I have the website there also specified the antecedent-based interventions. I know their, their training was specifically for autism, but I mean, these affirm modules, these affirm interventions or evidence-based interventions that are on the affirm website, they work for all kids. I've used them for all kids with disabilities, without disabilities, okay? But another antecedent strategy that I think is crucial is for not the kid necessarily, but for us, for us to just take a breather, take a breath. We need to be okay too. We need to be okay before we intervene. Um, so if you know, you know, your child's going to be acting up a certain way, find a way to calm yourself down and think rationally, okay? And that makes you way more proactive. So whether it's counting, which I used to do a lot as a school psychologist, you'd see me around campus just counting to 10 and breathing in and out, deep breaths. Um, and this is also a cute, a cute sample. I think I got this from Conscious Discipline which Louise Brennis and Susana Avila Salgado, also um, team members from CELPA, uh, shared with you possibly last week. I could be wrong, but um, this is a cute little visual to have to practice calming strategies with your child so you guys can do it together, okay? So if you recall, I had said I'd, I'd go further into the sensory supports that might help your children who are more of a sensory seekers, okay? These are uh, strategies that we recommend to have a lot in the classroom, but you guys can definitely have this in the home. Uh, rice bins, bean bins, you can make little games with it um, by having um, little plastic animals. I think I used to use spiders in a huge bin of rice and the kids had to like look for the spider within that bin of rice and that, oh, it felt so nice for them because they wanted that sensory. So they would take those sensory breaks throughout the day where they can embed their, their hands within that rice and then pull out, you know, those, those colorful animals that were in there or spiders. Um, I believe a month ago or so, Patty McDonald, um, she did a training for CAC and that's uploaded, I think on our website as well. And she's our occupational therapist. She provided a lot of ideas. So I'm not gonna go in depth because that's all on our website. This is just a snapshot of some things you guys can do. A reminder, for kiddos who you see often fidgety in their seats, I like to put tennis balls. You can even put tennis balls diagonally on one leg and then on the back leg and then on the front leg. And that gives them more of an imbalance. Um, offering different seating choices within your home to complete activities, whether it be a couch, uh, the kitchen chair, a high chair, a stool, maybe they'd like to do things walking on a clipboard. Um, so these are just some choices you can use. Like I mentioned earlier, headphones, earplugs, all help kind of block out some noises. Um, This is an, an antecedent strategy that we use often. Just we, an antecedent would, would be to have it ready, to have it ready to go before you start something, okay? We're trying 
trying to prevent behaviors. We're trying to decrease the chances of problem behaviors. So you want to use maybe the pre-map principle, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is using a first and then scenario. Like first we're going to do five minutes of math and then we're going to go hop on the trampoline. You know, it just depends. But using a first then chart, having it ready, having it colorful, maybe even doing a first then chart and your child got to draw on it or color it, make it very personal to them and have them feel ownership over this first then chart. Oh, I made this. I made this. That means I'm going to follow it because I made it, right? And it's important. Sometimes uh, tasks are have too many steps. Think about brushing teeth, right? brushing our teeth. I have kiddos who are in high school who don't want to brush their teeth. They have so many steps. And sometimes what we have to do is just break it down step by step. Pick up your toothbrush. Great job. Um, okay, put some toothpaste. Awesome job, right? So you can use a chart like this, um, just writing. I would use these type of charts with my kiddos who knew how to read, and then I just check it off. But I'd have it ready. And it wouldn't need to be anything laminated, anything fancy. I always have a dry erase board with me when I'd be with students, or I'd have little post-it notes. These all really help if you have them ready to go um, to remind children, students, teens, whomever, what they get to work for, what they get to earn. It gets them thinking positively, right? Plus, though, Usually when we're using these, we're also providing that specific praise and we're being very enthusiastic and maybe possibly affectionate or we're having these, these big smiles on our faces. So that's a double whammy, right? Double incentive, double motivation for a child to work and do what it is they, they need to do to get what it is they want. These are just other examples. There are just countless of examples on, on the internet and on our SAPA web page, I'm sure you guys all know of Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers and Instagram, there's just a plethora. But these are all pretty useful and colorful and just to get us thinking of how to structure a kiddo's environment and be proactive to minimize those problem types of behaviors. Okay, some kids don't understand a timer. I know we talked about timers. We might have reviewed this one, um, last week or so with Kim and Susana using post-it notes instead of a timer, if they don't just have the concept of time and just counting out five, four, three, two, one. Okay, those are ideas. This is another way to provide structure. I mentioned earlier, allowing children to choose where they're gonna be seated whenever they're completing a certain task um, whether it be on the floor, whether it be on um, the chairs, standing, whatnot, maybe organizing uh, the work area as much as possible. If you're having a hard time getting your kid to do his homework or his classwork, his classwork now, um, you might want to organize it this way. You might want to use visual or color folders so that you can easily uh, use like a first then or a multi-step a list and divide it and your child knows where to go, when to go, what to expect, right? You can use colors, uh, numbers, you name it. Anyhow, these are ways to provide structure. Something that I, I want to talk about that when you're in, in an academic type situation with your kid, as you probably all are, is behavior momentum. This is a very helpful strategy. I used to use it a lot when I'd be one-on-one -on -one with kids, um, especially when I wanted to get them to do some academic tasks, okay? Um, and it's all about making several easy requests for a child to do. So we ask them to do, um, for example, draw a happy face, right? Wait, wait, maybe a second. They draw the happy face. Yay, you drew the happy face. We give them praise. Then we say, show me the star. Maybe they point to the star. Yeah, you pointed to the star. Color the balloon red, their favorite color. Because I, I know that, right? That's going to be more reinforcing. So they color the balloon red. Spell kite. They spell kite. Well, they hate writing, but they spelled it. Why? Because I used behavior momentum. Behavioral momentum works if the time delay is super, super short. I'm saying like three seconds, maybe. Otherwise, you lose that momentum. You lose that anticipation, okay? And making sure that we're 
uh, praising them with high fives, big smiles, thumbs up, tickle, tickle, uh, in between every single uh, task. So now, we talked about behavioral momentum, we talked about rewarding them after every task that they do do. Well, that's reinforcement, if it's gonna increase the likelihood of a behavior. So let's talk about reinforcement, because reinforcement is one of the most important concepts to understand when it comes to positive behavior interventions and supports or applied behavior analysis. Reinforcement simply means though, that something is happening right after behavior and it's increasing those chances of it happening again and again. Sorry. So you have a behavior that occurs and then something happens right after a consequence, whether it's positive or negative. And then as a result, later on, that behavior occurs again. So reinforcement, anything at or taken away that increases behavior. If you come to me and say, I'm using reinforcement and it's not working, you're not using reinforcement because it's not increasing behavior, okay? So reinforcement can be positive and it can be negative. And what I mean by this is that um, we can add something to someone's environment immediately after their behavior and as a result, the behavior happens again. Or we can remove something from their environment immediately after the behavior. And again, behavior happens more often in the future. Re reinforcement can be positive or it can be negative. As long as it increases that behavior in the future, it can be termed reinforcement and it's a very effective strategy. For example, we have a child learning to put on their shoes so after putting on their shoes, she's allowed to play outside. So she puts on her shoes more often in the future because she puts on her shoes and she gets, they give her something. They allow her access to play outside. Negative reinforcement, child is learning to put on their shoes. She's not allowed to play outside until she puts on her shoes with or without depending on her skill level, right? So she still puts on her shoes more often because if she does it, then the reinforcement will be withdrawn. Those are just simple examples. Another example would be maybe your child um, shows you that they finished their homework all by themselves. And then you say, yeah, great job finishing all your homework. Um, and then you give them a chocolate chip cookie. I use chocolate chip cookies because I love chocolate chip cookies. Um, and then tomorrow he does it all by himself again. And again, you praise and give him a chocolate chip cookie, right? Um, but let's say uh, your child comes to you, finishes homework by himself. You're know, like, well, you should have already done it. It's your responsibility. And then you walk away. Well, guess what? Tomorrow they're not gonna do their homework because they didn't get any praise or reward from you. So that's what I mean by reinforcement. Let's see, change. Okay. Just some things to keep in mind about reinforcement. Let's see, we're at 622. Um, reinforcement has to happen immediately. The longer you wait to provide reinforcement, the less effective it's gonna be. I mean, honestly, 30 seconds or less, that is what the research shows. You wanna do something immediately. Sometimes I know it's not possible, it's not even feasible to provide it, which is why we use stuff like that, like that chart, that cute little school bus fire engine chart, because just that fire engine, if your kiddo loves fire engines, um, may already be reinforcing. And then the fact that you're like putting little stars or he gets to put little firemen every time he does something, that could be reinforcing too, right? But you have to provide that fireman immediately so they can cover one of those boxes. And then they get to box 10 and then they get that big, really big reinforcer, right? But no matter what you do, when you provide reinforcement, it has to be immediate. And I'm saying 30 seconds or less. It has to be frequently, okay? Especially if you're barely starting to um, implement this strategy with the kid and, and you're barely starting to want to change a certain behavior to promote those uh, socially acceptable behaviors. You need to do it every single time. So as time passes and a kiddo's increasing in those uh, pro-social behaviors, then you can start fading away, decreasing the reinforcement. Maybe next time you just 
uh, do it every other time they do what they're supposed to do or every third time or every fifth time, little by little bit, decreasing it, fading it away. But at first it has to happen every single time. All right. Um, so frequently throughout the entire day. Um, let's see. You want to make sure you're being enthusiastic. It's easy to say, good job. But I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, people trying to praise your children and just by without any enthusiasm, any facial expression that signifies that they're happy, right, for them. So it doesn't always work so well, right? We want enthusiasm. We want excitement. We want to be congratulatory because then otherwise it seems artificial and kids can tell when we're being artificial. So we want to be enthusiastic. We want to use eye con contact. Yes, your kid may not uh, like to look into your eyes. Okay, but try and find a way to use eye contact. Why? Because it it, it strengthens that bond, that relationship. Just like enthusiast, um, just like enthusiasm, enthusiasm, eye contact suggests that they've done something super special and it deserves your recognition. So use it as much as possible. You also wanna be very specific when you're providing that praise, that reward of what they did right. Kids don't always understand why they're getting that chocolate chip cookie. They don't always understand why they're getting this prize. So we want to describe it for them. You did three problems. Yesterday, you only did one. This is awesome. Here you go. High five. Here's a sticker. Okay. Very specific. And then they can build off of that. We want to hype it up as much as possible. So if that means talking about what they get to earn throughout the day or praising what they already do, what they already do right um, on a regular basis, this gives them more motivation to, to succeed. Okay, um, we have anticipation. We want to vary our reinforcers because who wants to get the same thing over and over again? Um, you're giving me 10 chocolate chip cookies in one day. I'm not gonna want 10 chocolate chip, I'm not gonna want a chocolate chip cookies for a week after that, right? We want to vary, vary the reinforcers because you, there's a, there's a concept known as satiation. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. You get tired of the same thing over and over and over again. So you want to have maybe a reinforcement menu. And that could just be a simple list on a post-it. Okay, this works for my child to increase behavior. This works for my child to promote behavior. And so does this. And then have those things ready, available. Or if you've already taught them about these boards, um, then you can use that and then have the reinforcement available at a later time. But definitely use variety. Okay. There are also different types of reinforcement, okay? Not just positive or negative, but different ways to reinforce a behavior. Sometimes we just, we need to reinforce other behaviors, anything. Because for instance, if a child is hating himself um, every three, four minutes, um, then maybe if we do a high five um, for not hitting yourself every five minutes, um, that's reinforcing not hitting their behaviors and keeping their hands still and doing something else. So reinforcing anything else the child does, but as long as they're not hitting their head every five minutes. This might increase uh, doing something else. Maybe it's not something very appropriate, but it's better than hitting your head and causing self-harm. So in those cases, we might wanna just reinforce anything as long as they're not injuring themselves. There's also reinforcing lesser behaviors. So uh, for example, taking into consideration that chart with the fire engine, maybe giving them a, um, a sticker or a token every single time they ask for help during their work lesson five times or less, because typically they're asking help at least six times or less during that, I don't know, five minute period or whatever. So at this point, we don't want them to lose requesting for help. That's a skill. Some kids don't request help, you know? Some kids just get upset and don't wanna do it. You wanna reward them for requesting for help, but you just don't want them to do it so often. So this is where the data taking is very important because we're like, okay, today my son or my daughter asked me for assistance five times in five minutes. That's just too much. That means they're doing independent work, maybe less than a minute, okay? So you collect your data and then you figure out, okay, five times every five minutes, I'm gonna reward them for asking for help four times within those five minutes. And then in two weeks, if they do it consistently, I'm gonna reward them every 
three times if they only ask for help three times in those five minutes, two times in those five minutes, one time in those five minutes, one time in those 10 minutes, okay? There's also something known as reinforcing incompatible behaviors. And you start thinking about this when, um, let's say children are running into the house. Well, you want them to do something where they can't run. So what can they do that uh, prevents them from running? Walking, right? So you reinforce every time they walk into the, the house after playing outside with their, with their siblings. That's reinforcement of incompatible behaviors. Or you might want to reinforce other behaviors. So this is the most typical, I think, uh, receiving positive praise when a child learns to tap or to engages in tapping on a mother's shoulder whenever he or she wants attention, rather than screaming and yelling when she's on the phone. Okay, so that's typical, but there's also other types of reinforcement that we want to maybe utilize and test. Okay, um, I mentioned earlier varying the reinforcement. We also want to vary the words that we use, okay? Um, because kids get tired of good job. Way to go, awesome, right? So this is just a cute little handout. You can print it out or save it on your phone. Uh, there's a website just to vary the praise that we use. And this could also help expand their vocabulary, right? But again, just like with all forms of reinforcement, praise can serve as reinforcement and it has to be immediately. And praise is typically one to five seconds because you praise 30 seconds or a minute later like, uh why are you praising me? That momentum's lost, right? So praising immediately, being very specific about what you're praising, doing it frequently, varying the words that you use, making it sincere with enthusiasm, right? Remember our facial expressions whenever we're praising someone. Remember our hand gestures, our, our, our body language, our intonation in our voice. All of that matters when we're providing specific praise. Um, we definitely want to acknowledge small improvements, increments. We definitely want to shape behavior, right? Little by little, baby steps for a lot of our, our kiddos, especially kids with disabilities. But we don't want to sound false. We don't want to come off as fake and over praise because then kids get tired of praise too. Okay, I'm tired of hearing I'm the best. I already know it. Okay, so don't over praise, but just be consistent about it and delivering it frequently and using it as an actual reinforcement strategy if that does work as a reinforcement strategy for your child. Very careful with but. Often we're like, you did such a great job finishing it, but, well, that negates the praise you just delivered. Stay away from but. Use the but in a different sentence later on after you've waited some time that you reinforce, maybe tomorrow. Hey, so yesterday we did some of this. Today I want to review this to make sure you do it correct, right? Stay away from those buts. These are some cool little um, incentives charts. I love charts because I can deliver it immediately and I can make a bunch of copies of them. And kids always like to make them super personable. Um, and then I can really deliver the bigger reinforcement because sometimes the only thing that's reinforcing for a child could be like something that's kind of expensive um, or maybe uh, something that you just can't produce every single day throughout the day. So these are just other ideas and some websites of where you can get free charts and print them out, use them on your phone, or just use a dry erase board or a blank sheet of paper and draw it yourself with markers. That's what I used to do. I didn't want to spend all that money. <laughs> but anyhow, just some ideas. Okay, I know extinction is a big one out there that we often say we're, we're trying to use and it and and if you hear terms like planned ignoring for kiddos who uh, want a lot of attention, that's a form of, of trying to extinguish a behavior. Basically, we're trying to stop a behavior from happening. Um, and by that, we need to stop providing the reinforcement because again, reinforcement does what? Reinforcement increases behavior. So if we stop using reinforcement for a behavior we don't want, that's known as extinction, okay? Never use extinction by itself. Always incorporate 
a different technique, like reinforcing that behavior you want to see, ignoring the behavior you don't want to see, ignoring the crying, but reinforcing the using the words. Okay, that's an, an example. And, and watch out for that extinction burst, because when you implement a strategy at first, I bet you it's probably going to get worse because kids have this learned behavior. They, they, they learn that tantruming, that crying, that shouting, that throwing, that hitting themselves may get them what they want. So they're going to try extra hard because that's what they know how to do. We are responsible to teach them how to behave in a way that's more socially acceptable, less harmful, maybe doesn't even require so much effort to get what they want, whether it's something or avoid or escape or sensory item, something, right? So that is the concept of extinction. And it, and it does work as long as you use another strategy to try to promote that desired behavior, okay? So wait, what if reinforcement doesn't work? I think I mentioned one of the first slides, right? I get a lot of people telling me, I'm using reinforcement and it's just, it's not working. And like I said earlier, well, if it's really reinforcement uh, and it's not working, then it's not reinforcement, right? So we really have to see, okay, let's ask us all these questions. Was it really necessary to implement a reinforcement strategy? Because sometimes it's not needed. Sometimes we're just trying to change a behavior that's maybe already occurring in certain contexts, right? Or, or maybe it's already occurring in a certain way and it meets the child's needs and, it, and it's meaningful and it's actually socially acceptable, but you don't want it that way. You want it different, right? So really, is it necessary to use reinforcement or maybe we can use something different? Um, is it a reinforcer or is it a preference? Sometimes we confuse the two, but they're different. Um, you guys as parents uh, can quickly do a preference assessment at home. You observe a child for a few minutes, just like the data collection in a certain setting, you give them free range, free access to all those items within that setting, whether it be the bedroom, the living room, the kitchen, outside backyard, right? Just put all those items out in, a, in, in front of the child and for a few minutes, see what they get, see how long they spend with a certain item, right? And then those top five items, um, use those as a reinforce within your reinforcement menu for the most part. Uh, so that's, but there's a difference because something that is preferred from someone doesn't mean I'm going to work for it. I love it, but this here takes way more effort. So I rather, I don't care for that preference when I have to do something I don't want to do. So we need to ensure that those preferences, usually the top five on the list, work as reinforcers. Edibles for kids who like to eat also work, but up to you if you want to stay away from those. Um, also, have we established it as a reinforcer? I had showed you the um, chart, the reinforcement chart, the reward chart with the fire engine. Well, unless we've used that to establish that they get these stars, that, that's a good sign um, of, and it's going to lead to something bigger, unless we've taught them how to use it and what it means, then maybe we haven't really established this item, this, this reward chart as a reinforcer, and we need to teach them. We need to do it little by little in small sections, right? Um, also, have the conditions changed? So we reviewed setting events earlier, right? Um, medication changes, um, hunger, thirst, social stuff, social relations, uh, family dynamics, um, environmental, factors, right? We talked about that earlier. Have those conditions changed? Could those, could any of those be a reason to why your child um, is behaving differently today? Okay. Um, stuff we need to consider because maybe what was rewarding in one setting, you go to a different setting, it's not as rewarding anymore. Okay. So getting a chocolate chip cookie after doing my homework with my mom is awesome when it's just my mom and, and me. But let's say my cousins come and visit, even during quarantine, you know, we're hanging out. I don't care for that chocolate chip cookie. I wanna go play with my cousins. So I'm not gonna do the homework, okay? Setting events, environmental factors, they have changed. And then ultimately ask yourself, are you varying those reinforcers? 
do you have that reinforcer menu available? And if, and if you don't, or if you do, you're using it and it's not working, then maybe we need to do another practice assessment in a different setting, right? Maybe it's outdoors, maybe it's a social, maybe it's a sensory issue. We need to investigate those, those other areas as well to ensure that what we're, we're actually providing a reinforcement to do a behavior and increase it and promote it. So this is just one of my, my favorite um, quotes from B.F. Skinner. The consequences of an act affect the probability of it occurring again. So I, 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 can't, I want us to, to think about just what's happening right after the behavior, always. What happens right after that could be making this behavior happen over and over and over again, right? Always having our detective hats on. And I just wanna leave you with that. Um, if you have any questions, comments, um, please go ahead and type them up in the chat.